not the part of GDP. Now, so intermediate goods or, or used goods. So imagine, if you will, that um, prior to Black Hawk Tech opening up in this school, that I owned this school or my family did. Right, so before Black Hawk moved into this building, this building was mine. And Black Hawk, the, the city of Janesville, came up and said, we want to open up Black Hawk Technical College. We need to buy the school from you. You know, it, it wasn't as big as it is now because they've added on, but you know, somebody had to own it, right? When Janesville, the city of Janesville, bought it from that person, did it add to GDP? It was a good, but was it new? No, it was used. Okay, so in other words, if you ever buy something where all you do is trade ownership of something, it doesn't count towards GDP. That's essentially the sale of a used good. All right, so with that in mind, down at the New York Stock Exchange, when I buy and sell uh, you know, a share of stock in IBM or Microsoft or whatever, am I generating GDP? What, is a, what does a share of stock represent? It represents ownership, right? So when I sell this ownership to someone else, have I created anything new? No. All I've done is said I used to own a portion of Microsoft or, or Apple or whoever, and I've traded it to someone else for a certain amount of money. All I've done is traded ownership. Have I created anything? No. All the money that people are, quote, unquote, earning on stock sales, not a part of GDP. Because all they're doing is buying and selling used goods. That's what stocks are, folks. They're not new, ever. Right? Even when you buy stock on an initial stock offering, it's not new. It's just the person who owned all of it beforehand. Right? So when what's his face in Facebook sold, went public, he said, I have all the ownership of this company. Now I'm going to sell some of it to a bunch of other people. When he did that, did he, did he generate any GDP? No, because all I did was gave away some of his ownership. That's it. All right? So stocks and bonds, so the sale of stocks and bonds is definitely not GDP either. Now, if you have a broker who earns a commission because he was buying and selling stocks and bonds, that's the service that that person is providing you in order to enable you to buy and sell the stock, yes. That is GDP. But the actual sale of stocks and bonds doesn't mean a thing GDP-wise. All right? So a real estate company makes money off of their service of sales of homes. Right. But if you owned all the properties yourself, say a real estate company owned all the properties itself and said to this gentleman or agent. Okay. Their service is still adding to GDP. The service of selling it to someone, if they get paid a service fee, yes. But, but the actual sale, from the sale doesn't go nope, doesn't affect GDP at all. So if you bought the property or land for $50,000 and then you sold it for $250,000, that doesn't mean anything, right? Why, why is that no problem? Because it's just trading of ownership. You haven't created anything. Remember, it's produced. You have to be producing something. So if you, That's just money. This is real things. Is money a land, labor, or capital? It's a way of measuring it, yes. But is it anything real? Are you making anything real when you make a profit? No. It's got to be real, right? Again, sale of stocks and bonds. If I buy a, stock, if I buy a, a share of Apple for $5 and sell it for $500, I quote unquote earn $450 of profit or $495 of profit, right? Did I produce anything in that $495? No, same thing. It's exactly the same thing, right? So earning profit does not equal GDP, right? Because the idea here is that nothing that you actually do ever actually takes away from GDP, right? That, yes, so if you own land and the land is worth twenty or 30000 and you build something on it that's new, yeah, if you add to it, you're adding to the value, yes. So if you build a, if you build a deck onto your existing house, that deck, GDP, right? 
And now all, how it's going to get measured is in the value of your actual house. But the deck by itself, that is, a, you know, if it was new when you, when you put it on there, that it's GDP. All right. All right, so there is one gray area. Because it's, it's a little tricky as to how or whether or not this particular type of transaction, whether it actually does work. So imagine if you take $1,000, you give it to your bank, you put it in a savings account, and that bank says, I'm going to pay you 2% interest. And over a year, it earns 2% interest, and they give you 20 bucks. What do you think? All right, so. Yeah, under some instances, interest is GDP. The idea here is that when you gave that $1,000 to the bank, what's the bank going to do with that $1,000? It may invest it in somewhere else. It's going to start moving money around so that there will be the ability to provide financial services to people, to provide loans to people, so that it will allow for growth. The idea then is that when you earn interest on an investment, as long as the investment is private, it's GDP. So if you invest into a, you know, M and I bank, if you invest in, you know, First Bank and Trust, and you earn interest on it, that interest is actually considered a part of GDP because you're giving them money that they are going to use to create something in the future. At least that's how it's explained. All right, this is very hand wavy, and it's like I said, it's the gray area. But it's again just the rules. So if the interest comes from a private industry, then it is. GDP. So if it's interest on a bond investment or interest on a bank account, all of those sorts of things, GDP. When it isn't, well, the the bank has to be private. So if you lend, if you in in theory, you're lending the money to the bank to use, right? And they're paying you to let them use it. Right? That's what interest really is, is the bank paying you so that they can use the money. So that they are going to use the money to create something. And that's why, in theory, the money they pay you is generating real GDP and counts. Now, when it's not is when you don't get it from a private investment company. So what's not a private bank? A government bank. Right? So in other words, if you buy a U.S. savings bond, right? when you buy a U.S. savings bond, they're going to pay you interest. Right? The U.S. government's going to pay you interest. Technically, when you, when you earn money because you lent money to the, to the government, we, we consider it not GDP because governments don't really use money to make anything because governments suck. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, <laughs> so this is the one slightly gray area is interest or any sort of uh, interest income that you make if it's coming from an investment that's privately held it's GDP if it's government held it's not. And then you get into those really, really gray areas like, well, what happens when you invest in a company that's owned partially by the government, like, say, Ford or GM, <laughs> who got bailed out by the government, right? So for a certain while, the government owns 40% of, of GM. Well, so if you got interest from an investment in GM and it was 40% government and 60% private, does that mean 40% of your interest counted and 60% of it didn't? <sighs> Yeah, that even I don't know how that works. Okay, I mean, honest, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's just scary. But in general, this is the rule, right? 
When you look at interest payments of some sort, just look where it's coming from. If it's coming from the government, it's not, right? Well, government workers do, but if you buy any government savings bond, right? So you go in and buy a, a U.S. savings bond for your, you know, so your brother had a kid, and you're going to go buy him a, a $100 U.S. savings bond so that when they turn 21, they get $100, right? I mean, that's what everybody does, right? Think about what happened when you were born. Your grandparents went to the bank and said, here's the $100 savings bond. You, your, your grandparents didn't do that for you? Wow. That's what... That's what that's a very classic Midwestern thing to do, right? I mean, you know, when, you're, when, you, when your relatives have a kid, you buy them a $100 savings. Because what do you... <laughs> it tends to be a classic one. But anyways, the fact remains is that the interest that that bond earns is not considered GDP because it's coming from the government. Whereas if they bought a $100 saving, you know, bond from IBM, because IBM's going to use that money to build a new factory, a new computer, a new something, then the interest they pay you is part of GDP. All right? Any, but anybody who's providing a service? Yes, always. Oh, my grandparents did that. Yeah. Well, they hadn't matured yet? I don't know. Well, they, 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 <laughs> yeah, I mean, most of them have a certain, you, you give the government like, you know, 60 or 70 bucks or, well, 20 or 30 way, way, way back when, and it earns interest up until it matures, and when it matures, then it'll be worth, quote, unquote, the face value of it. Yeah, so if it, <laughs> yeah, don't throw it away, because it's still. Uh, it depends on whether they bought a variable rate interest you know, U.S. savings bond, there's, we'll get to interest rates later, but in general, though, you did earn some interest while you were holding on to it, and all of that interest that you earned, technically, not a part of GDP, because it's coming from the government, so theoretically, you weren't helping the, the economy by doing that, all right, so again, this is the one slightly gray area where GDP is tough to determine whether or not it is or isn't, when it's interest payments, again, look to see where it's coming from, all right, and so often what these things are called, payments from the government for services that you're not providing, is often called a transfer payment, right? This is a government payment for doing nothing. These also do not count towards GDP, right? Can you think of anything that the government would pay you for for doing nothing? Unemployment. unemployment. That's the number one, right? The biggest one is unemployment, right? The whole point is that you got laid off and you're not working, and the government's paying you to not work. So you're not being productive, and you may think you're generating GDP because you're getting paid, right? I mean, government's sending you a check every two weeks. Technically, nope, that's not a part of GDP. If you get old enough and actually can collect it, any retirement benefits that you collect, Social Security, right, the whole point is that you, you quit working and now you're going to start collecting all the Social Security you put in, all those payments, not GDP, right, because again, you're getting paid to do nothing. Right? I mean, that's considered a transfer payment. All those sorts of things are transfer payments. What about private, private, uh, private pensions? Again, technically, those private pensions, when you get paid for them? Uh -uh. So it doesn't yeah, no. Disability? disability is right up there with it. So if you actually are getting a, a disability check because you, know, you took out insurance and the disability company is now covering some or all of your expenses, that's technically a, not, a transfer payment. You're, that, that won't count towards GDP, right? Because you're getting paid to, again, theoretically do nothing. And you're not being productive, right? There should be some production going on. If the money's not being productive, then it's not GDP. Well, grants, in theory, the grant money is, is there for you to do research or education or enhance your productivity, 
Hence, yes, it would be. Nope. Not GDP. Yeah, it's not just from government. It's just that a transfer payment will often be called a government payment, right? This is what people call entitlements. Right? This is what this is what the economy is saying is a really bad thing right now, is that there are too many entitlements by this government and we need to cut them out so that we can start not having so much debt, right? So any it doesn't necessarily have to be government to not count, but generally speaking, most of them are government driven stuff. Mm-hmm. So all of the you know sick days that you get paid when you, you you're at home sick and you get paid to, to not work. Shame on you. All right, all right. So there is GDP again. The the key to all of this is one. Notice all of the rules. It'd be, it's it's hard enough just for us to keep track of it. Imagine how good of a job do you think it does. <laughs> Yet this is how we determine whether or not our economy is growing, right? Is that a good idea? Should we use something else? What should we use if we don't use this? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, so please realize that this is calculated, you know, monthly, weekly, daily by the Department of Commerce. There's a subsidiary of the Department of Commerce that calculates what GDP is generated every year or every quarter by the U.S. True. But are you doing anything? Are you being productive? Are you producing anything? Doesn't matter what you did before. You, you, were, getting, you were generating GDP when you worked. All the money you earned while you were generating GDP, including the money you put into unemployment insurance, was generating GDP. As soon as you start getting paid to do nothing, it's not part of GDP, period. Whether it's coming from unemployment, whether it's coming from disability, whether it's coming from... Right, it's, it's not that you get paid that generates GDP, it's that you did something to get paid that's generating GDP, right? So again, like if you're getting a, a settlement for falling on the ice and cracking your skull, that's not GDP, right? But you're getting paid, right? You're getting an annuity, thousand dollars a month. Yeah, you got to be doing a good or a service. If you're not providing a good or a service in the process, then theoretically it shouldn't be a part of GDP, right? So that's why all of these things, in theory, these sorts of things, bartering, it really should be a part of GDP, right? Because you are producing something, you are doing a service. But the problem with it is we can't track it, right? So these are ones where it should be generating GDP, but we don't know how. These ones, we can track it, but you're not doing anything. So it's not producing anything. So again, we can't put it into the numbers. It, it doesn't, it's not measurable for us, all right? So there's two sides to the coin of when things don't affect GDP. It's when you're not producing anything or we can't track the fact that you are producing something. Again, it, it points out that GDP is an imperfect science, folks. I mean, I wish that we didn't use it as such a barometer for how the country is doing, because it, it, it's, it's not exact. In your opinion, what would be better? <sighs> I can't think of anything better. That's the problem. <laughs> right? I mean, the, there could be things that we could try and add to GDP. Because, I mean, think about what your guys are doing, right? What happens? in this country every weekend. I mean, do you guys work on the week? Well, some of you do probably, but for, for a lot of us, when we get to the weekends, we get two days off, right? Hopefully. <laughs> or at least we're working for that, right? We want to get two days off, but when we do two days of nothing, what happens to GDP? Yeah, it suffers, right? So the whole point of working hard so that we can not have to work sometimes, I mean, I mean once you're not working, I mean, that's what you want as an individual, right? But as a country, yeah. It's like, quit it, you guys. Quit taking any vacations. Quit taking your weekends off. Work all the time, 24-7, seven days a week. That would hurt GDP, though. Right, it does. If the stable prices wouldn't matter. 
<laughs> well, the, but, but we work all the time. We, we buy less. We haven't gotten to we haven't gotten to this yet. All we're caring about right now is economic growth, right? In, in in order for us to have better economic growth, you guys should never take a vacation. In theory, right? If you're salaried, right? Yeah. Yeah. Again, though, it's one of those where, you know, it's a, how you measure it and how a little fuzzy to some degree, right? But the fact remains is that. Taking days off, leisure time, is another one of those things that's not inside of GDP, right? So leisure is not in there. Should it be? Well, hell yeah, right? It's, it's a quality of life that we get to have some time off. So should we put a dollar amount to it? We probably should. We don't right now, though, right? The other thing that, that GDP is all about is quantity instead of quality. GDP doesn't care how good the product is. GDP care, just cares that it's a good. Right? So if, if the, a Ford rolls off the line and it only works for two days, that's the same amount of GDP if a Ford rolls off the line and it runs for 10 years. Right? The quality of the product that comes, off of, that comes out of our work is unimportant to GDP. We, we have no way of measuring it, right? So, you know, you know, if you if you bought a if you bought a, a a washing machine ten years ago, I don't know, it has to be more like thirty years ago. It's probably still working. You bought one ten years ago. I guarantee you've gotten another one already. <laughs> right? Why? Because the quality has not been as good, right? And. <laughs> income disposable income. Yeah, the disposable economy. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not. Is it bad or good? I, you know, again, I'm not. I'm not going to put labels on anything. I'm just pointing out that this is a. It's an unfortunate use, an unfortunate way for us to measure our our productivity. But there's nothing we have better, so that's why we continue to use it. You know, that just welcome to economics. Ugh. Okay, again. Yeah, that's pretty much the way it works. So you will probably have questions on quizzes and or homeworks that will say, this activity happened. Tell me not. Tell me whether or not it's going. Right. So um, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, I. Uh, Yeah, these are these are going to be types of questions that might show up on a quiz or test, right? So I build um, I build a uh, a new um, boat. Is this GDP? It is if what happens? If I sell it, right? If I build it by myself and just use it myself and never bother to sell it, does the government know that I built it? No. no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, you, you play two sides of the coin here. Uh huh. I build. Yes, I agree. A new boat. I am buying that product. That produces. Oh, and I didn't say anything about the product, the buying of, of anything before it. Well, for me to build. I didn't tell. I didn't tell you where the the, the product, the, the the material came from. I'm just asking the the, pro, the the service I did of building a new boat. I didn't tell you about anything about buying the parts. Period. You're reading into that problem by doing that. Don't do that. All right. That's where it's a trick problem. This is not GDP. Oh yes. Right. This is what I want you to not get tricked by. Right. This is a classic trick question on an economics quiz or test. Well, I mean, the, the, the correct answer right now is that it's not GDP yet. Yes. Yet, right? It could be if I somehow sell it and then deal with sales tax and all the other kind of business. Okay. Then it is, all right? So the actual selling of it does have to happen. There does have to be money involved, OK? All right, so again, though, be careful, right? I collect my disability check. Of five thousand dollars. 
All I did was collect it. That's it. I got paid because I'm disabled. This is not GDP, right? So even though there's money involved, you may think, ooh, there's money, therefore it's GDP. No, right? Because that's one of these transfer payments, right? Where I did nothing to earn it. All I did was had a disability or became disabled, whichever one it was, all right? Uh, so let's see. Um, I earned $2,000 for selling a used home. My service is the sale of the home is not. All right. So the fact that I am working and selling this house, I am producing a service that is getting this house changing hands from one person to another. That two thousand dollars is GDP. So right, this is not yet. <laughs> this is flat out no, and this is definitely yes. Um, let's see. I didn't say I earned two thousand dollars from selling the house. I said I earned I earned two thousand by selling the house, right? So when you make your new house request, you aren't just saying like the moment you enter that house you want to sell it. The answer is yes. You aren't saying the two thousand dollars is GDP. And the sale of the house is not. Yeah, that would be great. That would be lovely. I would love that answer. Yeah, that would be extra credit. Uh, let's see. Um, if I added all of that stuff in there, like where all the parts, you'd say that the parts that you purchased that were new that you used to build the boat would be GDP, but still the boat of, in and of itself is not. It doesn't have, well, it's more along lines of I haven't sold it yet. Right? The key here is that there was no money from making the boat. I didn't make any, I didn't earn any money from the building of this boat until I have earned cash. It has to have dollar signs associated with it. If I haven't in any way, shape, or form made money be known to this product, it's not GDP. Yep. Yep. So, I went home and I cooked dinner for my family. Yes. You didn't produce anything. I made dinner. I produced dinner. Exactly. Is there any money going on inside of here, folks? No, no money. Therefore, no. So all you housewives are thinking you're at GDP, hey. Technically they're not. Until until house house Spouses. Still, let's not let throw a label on it. It could be either, anybody, right? <laughs> I agree. I agree. Um, let's see. Um, I uh, I I got uh, 150 dollars in interest on on my uh, on my savings account. From M and I. BMO. <laughs> BMO, as they call it. Yes. One hundred and fifty dollars of interest. Interest is the scary one. There, you have to ask, where did the interest come from? Private. It's a private industry, therefore, yes. Right. This is GDP. Um. Let's see. Ah. Uh, I um. I did not teach over the summer and collected a thousand dollars in unemployment. Why not? I got paid. Oh, Philly family, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> Let's not go down that road. All right. Um, let's
let's see. Let's do one more. Uh, let's try. Um, <laughs> uh, I sold. I sold my um, baseball card collection for eight thousand dollars. Amen. Right. Even though there's money involved, those baseball cards generated GDP when they first came out. And yeah, I bought them for a dime a package, and I'm making a lot more money off of it than I thought I was going to, but the fact remains is that extra value didn't add to GDP. That's actually for my, my parents. My parents, my dad had a, full, had a full top set of 1952 to 1954 baseball cards. He had them in, in mint condition, and he went on sabbatical one year from teaching. My dad was a teacher as well, and they literally, they actually earned $14,000 from the sale of their baseball cards. They actually lived on it for a year while my parents went to school. It was really kind of cool. Fourteen grand. They had like Hank Aaron, Willie Mays, all these guys' rookie cards from Topps in mint condition. He sold one of the cards for $4,000. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so questions on what is and what is not GDP? We're pretty good? Okay. All right, so GDP, unfortunately, is the way we measure our economy's productivity. Good or bad, it is. Don't, you know, you certainly can bitch about it. That's the nice thing, right? And now you know why. You can now explain to people why GDP is such a, is an extremely stupid mecha, mechanism to measure our, our country's productivity. But <laughs> yeah, it's it's no <laughs> no more or less than anything that's happening in the government anyway. So I don't know, I suppose. Now, other uh, types of measurements. So you will often hear. Other terms used to describe how well our economy is doing. These other types, they're in the book, so I want to go over them, but please realize I will not test you on any of these things. Okay? GDP, I want you to know what GDP is. These other three things that I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about them so that you have heard them once, but they are not going to be on any quiz, test, or homework. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. But these other things, don't worry about them. But I want you to have heard them so that you, you know, in case you ever hear them come up again, you may remember me standing up here ranting about them, but telling you it's not all that important. All right. So one of the things that you will often hear about is national income. How much national income is there in our country? Abbreviated NI, because that's what the first letters are. National income, it's based off of GDP. The idea, though, is that as we produce things, those things also then decay. What do businesses do when machinery decays? They write it off, folks, and they write it off through depreciation. So whenever you buy a product, it has a lifespan, right? So this product is going to be useful for X number of years, and every year they will write off the depreciation value of that particular item, right? So if you buy a computer, really it's only going to be worthwhile for three years. Technically, every year you could write off a third of the value of your computer on your taxes because it's depreciation. It's actually a solid state product that you can write off if you actually itemize, right? I, and whenever I itemize, my computers are always in there because right? I buy a new one every year practically. All right, so. That's what national income is. It says take your GDP and subtract off however much depreciation we had because our products were falling apart, which makes sense, right? So personal income, this is now where we try and start talking about how much money or how much productivity, it's really money, how much money do people have, right? Because a lot of times what we say is the important thing about a country is not the corporations, but actually the people. That's bullshit, but it's what we try to say. <laughs> yes, uh -huh. again, it, the, it is what it is, but 
Regardless, the way we calculate personal income, we start with our national income. Remember GDP, take off our depreciation. Now, we want corporations out of this. So any money that corporate profit is, uh, corporations are keeping needs to be subtracted off. So any corporate profits are money that's not coming to, theoretically, us, right? Because the corporation's keeping it. They need another yacht in the Cayman Islands, just in case. The other thing that takes away from our paychecks, which you guys have probably seen every month, Social Security payments, right? So every paycheck you get, some portion of it goes off to Social Security, and so that takes away from our personal income. Now, remember that GDP does not include transfer payments, right? So when the government pays you for doing nothing, it's not in there. But if you want to know how much money do people have, those transfer payments are, that's part of it, right? So we actually have to add all of the transfer payments back in so that they're actually considered a part of the, the equation, right? So add those monies that people have to spend where they're getting paid for technically doing nothing. All right. So this is how the government will report how much personal income the nation has as a whole. All right. Those two, these two, national income, personal income, very you'll hear them if you're listening to a really serious, you know, economic radio or TV station, which means none of the ones that most people watch. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is when it's being reported on by a really old guy who's got absolutely no inflection in his voice in any way, shape, or form, and he'll just tell you on any given day the national income for the United States was $17.1 trillion. Personal income for this particular country was $15.5 trillion. He's on NPR. Yeah, he's on NPR, yeah. <laughs> the one that you may have heard a few times, though, is this one. Disposable income. Right, because this, what is disposable income? It's the money that you guys have on hand that you can actually spend. And corporations care about this, countries care about this, so this one is often out there somewhere. It's based on the personal income that we have, but where else do we have to send money every April 15th? to the government, and what are we paying at that time? Income taxes, right? So when we get paid, we have to pay the Social Security payments, right? That gets pulled out of our check. Our companies actually do this for us. And then come April 15th, we have to give them a little bit more because this wasn't enough. So we have to actually pay them some income taxes. So the amount of money we really have to spend, disposable, is really just taking away income taxes from our personal income. So. Know that you have heard these. You will not be tested over them, OK? All right. Da 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 da. OK, so our last thing that we need to do in this chapter is to figure out how do we really know when GDP is growing from year to year? Right, so what we've been doing so far, when we calculate these numbers, right? So when we calculate GDP in uh, 2010, it's going to be C plus I plus G plus X minus M. You guys are going to memorize that formula, right? Consum consumers spending, investment spending, government spending, exports, and imports. Please remember those. Right. But this is in 2010. How are we going to calculate it in 2011? We're going to do this. I mean, it doesn't matter. The, the formula stays the same from year to year. But remember that it's the value of all of these goods. So if we build a car in year 2010, it's worth, say, $12,000. When we build the exact same car the next year, it's worth $13,000, because that's how much it was sold for. Did we build a different car from year to year? No. What happened to make the car worth 
$13,000 the next year instead of $12,000 like it was the year before? Inflation. Inflation. All right. So the problem with GDP is that this is what's known as nominal GDP. Yes. Okay. C is consumer spending. How much money did we spend? I is business investment. So this is how much money did businesses spend to make themselves bigger. G is government spending. And again, it has to be government spending on real GDP stuff, right? Realize that your unemployment checks come from the government. So all government spending does not ne necessarily, yeah, right, be careful with it. And of course, X is exports. How many of our goods do we sell to foreigners? And M is imports. How many goods did we buy from foreigners? Again, sending our money outside of the circular flow model. Did we talk about circular flow model? Ah, shoot. OK. I apologize. There's two things I need to talk about. <laughs> For some reason, I thought we already did circular flow model. I apologize. Thank you. All right. So the circular flow model is basically a way for us to see how to calculate GDP in a picture instead of having it be a formula. All right. The circle is, is not exactly a circle, so bear with me to some degree. But the two major components of the circle are households or consumers. And what would be the opposite of a household? Businesses, right. Now, one of the things that we want to do when we follow the circular flow model is to follow the money. All right. So one way to follow the, the, the circular flow is to follow the dollars. So how does money flow from households to businesses? How do businesses get your money? You buy stuff. <laughs> you buy stuff, OK? So the, the key here, though, is that there needs to be a top piece of the circle where the money can go through. The product market. In other words, stores, right? So the idea is that we, in our households, we go up to the store, we bring our money up to it, we spend the money at the store, and we get our products. And where does that money go from the store? It flows down into the business's corporate coffers. Now, those corporate coffers, they're going to take their money, and what are they going to do with it? They're going to have to somehow get products produced, right? So how do they get the products produced? Well, that's where they have to go back to the households. Now, the way the money flows through the households, this one's a little bit weird, so bear with me. But where you guys go to get a job, according to economists, is what's called the factor market. You, each and every one of us is a factor of production. So the factor market is where businesses go to take their dollars and get one of you to build their tables, chairs, desks, airplanes, what have you. Okay. So the businesses take those dollars to the factor market. They buy you by hiring you. And when the appropriate amount of work is done, they pay you the money. And once you get the money, what do you do with it? You take it home. And then where do you do? What do you do with it? You buy more products. You go back to the product market and you spend more money. And where does the money go? 
back to the businesses. And so the businesses with that money, what do they do? They go back to the factory market and hire more people, right? So the whole circular flow model is describing how the economy works, right? And the whole cool part about it is that think about one $20 bill, right? One $20 bill, if the person in the household goes to the store and spends 20 bucks, that $20 flows to the business. This business is going to send that $20 to one of its workers and it's going to go back to the household. How much GDP did it generate, that 20 bucks? Well, I mean, the person was providing a service, right? They got, they had a service, and there was a good that was produced. There's 20. Now they got paid 20. <laughs> there it's already 80. Now, now it's back up here in the in the households. Where are the households going to do with that 20 dollars? They're going to go back up to the problem box, spend it again, and what's it going to do? 80 dollars, 80 dollars. It's going to keep flowing around. This is what drives the economy. The amount of monies out there is not necessarily as important as how fast the money is moving. So if you guys would just spend your money faster, and this would cycle around sooner, <laughs> the economy would flow a little bit faster, and now we can start to see growth a little bit faster even. That's chapter 17. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about it yet, but we'll get there. <laughs> All right, but that's the idea behind it, right? Is that one $20, whether it's a $20 bill or a check for $20, every time it circles around this flow, it's generating more GDP, and it's still just that one $20 over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. All right? This is what economists are looking at a lot right now, is how fast does that $20 travel around the circle? Because when it slows down, that's when the economy starts to slow down. Okay? And any time you have a disruption in any one of these portions of the circle, that's when you start having rece recessions, right? So for us in our country back in 2009, when we had our, uh, the start of our first recession, what ended up happening was that households ran into a bit of a problem. We didn't spend any money because all of a sudden the housing market crashed and this house that we thought was worth $250,000 is now only worth $100,000. <laughs> Oops. When all of a sudden you lose $150,000, what do you guys do as a bunch of consumers? You say, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> you start looking for chickens that you can sell eggs. Basically what ended up happening is that this ran out of money, right? We quit spending. All that happened was this piece of the circle got cut. Once you cut a piece of the circle, the circle is hosed. Right? Because once money quit following it, flowing into the businesses, what did the businesses do? They stopped hiring. They started laying people off. So what happened to the households? They got even less money. So, so the circle can go either way. It can be cycling down or it can be cycling up. This is one of the times where we want the cycle to be going up, right? Normally when we flush, we like it to go down. But <laughs> this is where we don't want it to go down. We want it to go up, right? We want growth. To have growth, we need this to be cycling outward as opposed to inward. So here we are traveling counterclockwise in the circle. Can you travel a different direction along the circle? Sure, you could go clockwise. <laughs> the, the other way you can travel around the circle is to follow the goods and services. The goods and services travel the other way, right? Because when you, in your household, go to the product market and buy something, what do you expect to get when you buy something? You, you expect to get something, right? <laughs> something, whatever it is, whether it's a, a new car or a, a, you know, a new sweater or what have you, and you are going to then take it back home, right? Similarly, when the business wants to sell stuff, in order for there to be products in the product market for the business to sell, what do they have to do? Right? Walmart has to go to China and buy something or pay somebody to make it and get it over to our product markets, our storefronts, and put them in there. And just like the money can flow around in a circle, the goods and services do as well.
and it just completes the circle. And again, it's another one of those things where if any one of these arrows becomes a problem, you start having trouble in your economy, right? This would be China, Japan when they had a tsunami and an earthquake to follow it, right? It wasn't that consumers couldn't buy things, it's that they couldn't transport the goods, right? People in Japan couldn't go to the store and bring their stuff home because, of course, their home was underneath 10 feet of water. That's a problem, right? That's all it takes for the economy to start tanking, all right? It, it, any piece, any one of these arrows up here, whenever there's a problem in it, that's when the economy starts to have a problem, all right? So what government's job is, remember government spending is a part of this, Whenever the government is watching over the industry or watching over the economy, it's looking at all of these arrows saying, is there a problem in any one of these? Anytime there is a problem, what does the government do? It Bails it out. It starts to put money into it, right? So if consumers stop spending money, if there isn't money flowing into the product market, the government steps in and says, ooh, I can pump money in there. If businesses are failing, if banks are going to go bankrupt and, and we don't want that to happen, what can the government do? Bail them out. If you get laid off and you're not getting paid anymore, the government will say, ah, you need unemployment payments. I can pay you unemployment, right? Or I can give you tax breaks. Either way, I can pump money directly into it. And so the government can say, ah, I know how to fix a piece of the circle because whenever one of these arrows has a problem, I can step in and say, here's money. <laughs> right? And hopefully, it's enough money to make up for how much was lost and everything keeps flowing upward instead of downward. Does it always work? Well, no. Governments, unfortunately, are not exactly very efficient. So, but that's their goal, right? And that's exactly what the governments are trying to do. They're trying to watch all these arrows and say, where, does the, where do we need to send the money to? And they need to, unfortunately, be relatively quick about it. And the more the government steps in and helps people, the less GDP you actually produce in the country. Theoretically, yes. But the idea, though, is that if you get this money to them, right, they will then go to their households, and what will they do with the money? They'll go up to the product market, and that product, that $20, which didn't generate GDP at first, once they buy a product, now it does. It goes to the business, and the business says, ooh, I got $20 to hire somebody. So now they will hire somebody with that $20. And so even though that first $20 may not count, all of the subsequent $20 will. But even though the government's bailing out what needs to be bailed out at, it puts more money because they don't have the money to provide retirement. Oh, who cares how much in debt we are? It's the government, right? If they need more money, they'll just print a whole bunch of it. Who cares? Well, it's China. It's China. <laughs> we'll get to that. That's, 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 again, that's chapter 14, 15, and on a little bit after that. All right, now, so, so the idea here is that realize this is C. This is I. In our GDP cap, go to the store and buy stuff. That's you spending consumer dollars, generating GDP through consumer spending. I is generating GDP through business investment. G is the government stepping in and saying, you know, I'm going to hire people if they're getting laid off, right? So I'm going to start road building projects, and that's how I'm going to get people a job and get them start working again, right? That's government spending. Where do exports and imports come in? Exports come from external, right? They come from outside of the US. So exports pump money into businesses. When businesses sell directly to a foreign company or a country or a person, that's still GDP for us, folks. We love it when we sell our goods to anybody. Right? Unfortunately, what do we do with some of our money? We buy imports, right? When you buy something that was imported, unfortunately, you're taking money out of the circle, right? And theoretically, businesses can do the same thing, right? Businesses could import some of their goods. Instead of buying the steel made in the United States, they may buy the steel that's, uh, that's produced in India or Canada or Japan or wherever it's being made. And similarly, 
I don't, it could be weird, but households could also sell to foreign countries as well, right? I mean, there's no problem. We could work for a foreign country if we want to. It's a little odd for that to happen. But that's just how some of these calculations for calculating GDP can directly relate to this circular flow model. So this circular flow, we'll come back to it on a regular basis, because this is really what drives the show, folks. I mean, this is, this is the whole economy in a nutshell. It's a nice, simple. I've simplified it a lot by just, yeah. I mean, it's just, but this is what's going on, right? It's just a regular circle, which makes it think like the economy isn't that big a deal, right? Don't think about the numbers behind all that, right? 17, 18, some trillion dollars worth of goods and services that we are producing in any given year. It's all right there in a nice little circle. So I, you know, I would like you to know the four squares and how the money and the goods flow. Because I'll probably ask you, you know, how does money flow from businesses to households? What does it flow through? So how does money get from businesses to households, goes through the factor market. Goes only through the factor market, right? There is no way for money to flow through the product market from businesses to households. That's not how it works, OK? So you do need to follow the flow appropriately, right? What flows from businesses to households through the product market? Goods and services, OK? So I mean, be able to read the circle as well, OK? So be able to reproduce it and then tell me what's going on inside of it. All right. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, so the way we measure inflation in GDP, just so that you know. It's done using this mechanism. It's called the GDP chain index. Basically, this is a normalized number for measuring how much prices have gone up or down between any one given year. All right. The way we use it is to calculate how to calculate or the way we use it is to calculate what we call real GDP instead of nominal GDP. So when we calculate GDP by adding up C plus I plus G plus X minus M, that's nominal. Just take the numbers, add them up. We don't worry about inflation in the beginning. We just add all the numbers up. Once you get all the numbers added up, that's when you correct. Okay. So you're going to take the nominal GDP, and you're just going to divide by whatever that GDP chain index is. And this number is like a percentage. And in order to then normalize the percentage out of it, you must multiply by 100 afterwards. Okay? It's just a, a formula that you can use to normalize GDP. Right? So if you hear that the US produced you know, $18.5 trillion worth of goods last year, which is about right, the actual sum of all the numbers. They will often then tell you right afterwards that real GDP was $17.2 trillion because they had to factor out the fact that there was inflation. All right? How do you predict the uh, this, it's a number that's centered around 100. If this GDP cha chain index is exactly 100, then there was no inflation at all. If it's more than 100, there was some inflation. If it's less than 100, we had the opposite of inflation called deflation. So just to give you a, an idea, um, assume that uh, nominal GDP was uh, $18.5 trillion in 2012. And the GDP chain index 
was 104. It's a little high. The real chain, GDP chain index is probably somewhere around 101 right now, 102. But this may be a problem that I ask you. Assume that these are going on and I say calculate real GDP. This would only be a homework problem, by the way, folks. I won't ask you this on the test because then I would have to ask you to bring a calculator. And that's too much of a pain in the butt. So the calculate real GDP, all you would do is just plug it into this formula, right? So take the $18.5 trillion, that's our nominal GDP, divide 104, and then multiply by 100 after you get that number. And that's what our real GDP will be for 2012. Anybody have? Oh, Nick, you have one? How much was GDP? Nah, just the first three. So real GDP in 2012 was only $17.7 .7 trillion instead of the 18.5 that we calculated by just adding up the numbers, all right? And so the idea is in that some of that some of that value came from prices going up instead of you creating something better or more, right? So if I teach the exact same classes but I got a three percent raise, am I adding anything to our to my productivity? No. Does that three percent should it really be a part of GDP? No, right? And that's how you will take it out, right? Now if I got a three percent raise because they made me teach another class. Which they did. <laughs> yeah, true, that's right, I volunteered, good point, that's right. Okay, so this is the end of chapter 11, folks. Is that what page it's on? Okay, so homework. Page 244, numbers, what were they, 4, 6, and 12? 4, 6, and 12. One of those questions should be, is this GDP? Okay. Please remember when you are reading that problem to not read more into it. All right. Only read what, it's, what is written. If you start talking about anything that wasn't written, then you've probably... <laughs> you will potentially get credit for things that you didn't if you explain things correctly or explain things in a manner that I consider correctly. Please realize that there will be a quiz next week on Wednesday. It will cover, I don't think we're going to get through all of chapter 12 on Monday, so it'll probably just cover.